Welcome to Papworth Hospital, the National Centre for Pulmonary Endarterectomy Surgery. We've made this film as some of our patients and their families said they didn't know what to expect after having the operation and they also felt nervous about taking their loved one home after the operation. Contributors to the film have been patients and their families who have experienced the operation and those professional members of the team that you'll meet along your surgical pathway. We hope you find it helpful. My advice in someone uh, preparing to come in for the operation is that uh, really they, they have to keep an open mind. They have to understand that uh, it is a complex procedure, but the quality of care and the expertise within Patworth Hospital is such one that will make you feel confident. I'd read all the stuff about what, what to expect, but it was... Um, it was quite a shock really, it was, it was quite a shock, but then again it was what I saw was exactly what had been described, what you would find, but when you actually see it, you know, lots of tubes and being in critical care, it is, it is quite a shock. I did feel, the one thing I did feel as soon as I walked into critical care was that, that Emma was being really well looked after, the, the staff were, you know, very, very good, so. Following pulmonary endarterectomy surgery, most patients are in the hospital for less than two weeks. Indeed, the average time in the hospital is coming down, but all patients would stay at least seven to eight days, and that's, that's about the minimum. Some patients do end up staying longer if they need more care or have complications following surgery. It's very normal and very understandable that relatives and, or, or partners or, or friends will, um, will share some of the emotions that um, a patient will be experiencing, um, again, before, during and, and after the surgery. So I think one of the best ways to prepare is, is perhaps to think about um, how, how they can as a family become experts really um, on, on perhaps the surgery and on the patient's condition. And I think they can become experts really by um, using the knowledge and the expertise of the medical team around them. Um, and I, I believe that the more, or what I, what I tend to see is the more, the more facts that people become familiar with, um, the more realistic expectations they have of, of surgery. And um, that serves as a better guide to what, what they can expect after surgery, what they can expect during surgery and how they can manage any any sort of difficulties that come up. It's definitely worse for the relatives. You're in a bed being looked after and everyone's running around and fussing over you. Um, and it was definitely hard on Michael. Um, he found it really tough to deal with, um, seeing me looking so poorly. And that's the reason why we didn't allow the children to come to the hospital as well. Um, but it was only for a few days. It was a few yeah. days and then I started getting better and I felt well um, and it's been worth it. So some people um, might experience um, um, a range in it, the intensity of their emotions. Um, for example, people will say um, that they're feeling extremely anxious about leaving hospital and perhaps going home and doing th things for themselves um, when they're used to um, a lot of help from the nursing staff. Other people might feel sort of um, slight apprehension but also excitement at the thought of going home as well. With regard to uh, uh, loved ones visiting their, uh, their partner or their husband uh, who's in critical care, they need to remember that it is a complex operation, it's a long operation and that uh, uh, their loved one might not be responsive for two or three days. It may take time uh, for them to actually uh, recover, but that I would say is that you have, to you have to expect that, but not something to be overly concerned about. I'd say some of the more common emotions that people experience um, uh, sort of during or after the surgery are um, feeling... Um, a sense of um, loss of independence or sometimes people describe it as a sort of um, feeling slightly powerless and um, that's completely normal 
it's um, usually due to the fact that people have gone through um, a major operation and they're in a recovery period and um, it, it will take time for them to get back to um, normal functioning. Um, but to actually see it was like, you know, the wife and stuff, that's, that was quite hard to sort of take it and then uh, sort of to stay strong for her and then sort of and then come back and see her the next day sitting bolt upright was, uh, was a complete difference. So, yeah, so that's it. Just maybe just speak to someone about it because sort of that have sort of could sort of talk you through it type thing because no one sort of I just sort of went into it blind sort of straight in and sort of like whoa what's sort of what's all this all about? So it was uh, and so the nurse did try to explain um, what all the bits and pieces were of it that just like you know just went out there out the window type thing. So. Uh, and For most patients they have just simple analgesia similar to what you can buy in a chemist and they don't need very strong painkillers by week two after surgery when they're going home. Energy dense foods that are quite good to have are things like cheese and crackers, um, perhaps small chocolate bars, biscuits, fruit loaves, anything they fancy. but. Foods like that are quite dense, so every bite will, will be a good amount of nutrition for them, energy, um, to help them heal and get their appetite back to normal. Even following surgery, it is vitally important that patients stay anticoagulated. The operation removes the chronic clot that was stuck in the lung arteries, but the anticoagulation is important to reduce the risk of new clot in the future. So all patients with this condition should stay on anticoagulation for life, even after surgery. So the physiotherapist will see you the first day after your operation to help start your rehabilitation, to get you stronger and fitter to go home. So the first day after the operation, the expectation is that you'll have a stand up and get out of bed. The physio will also make sure you can take a deep breath and cough because this can be quite painful after the operation. So they'll give you a rolled up towel which you can hold to your chest to support your wound. People's experience of um, post-surgery delirium can vary. So sometimes the dreams or the hallucinations that people experience um, can be quite pleasant and sometimes they can be very unpleasant and it's there, there's a variety of causes um, implicated in, in um, post-surgery delirium. There's a section in the information booklet about possible hallucinations um, which again I read and discarded but that, that actually happened to me and I've never had an experience like that before and it was very frightening and I was suffering quite extreme paranoia. I thought everybody in the hospital was against me and that must have been awful for the staff to deal with, although I gather they're probably quite used to it. But um, that was something else that I would just say, obviously it, it's fine now and I understand all that now, but um, not to get too concerned, you know, if it happens to a patient to for the person looking, you know, the staff, not the staff, the, the carers, the people, the relatives, not to get too um, concerned. Well, it, it took me a while to realise what was going on, to be honest with you, because um, although obviously when Emma had just woken up, she was a little bit disorientated, but she was still making sense. She knew who I was um, and she, you know, she asked about the kids. but. There was there was other stuff going on, which is it's it's very it's really weird because at the time, um, I didn't realise straight away what was happening. It came it came to a head the, the morning after Emma had woken up. I was staying in a local hotel and I got a phone call from from the nurse on critical care by Emma's bed saying that Emma wanted a word with me, and um, I spoke to Emma and she was really really coherent and she just said you need to phone my mother. I said, why is that? She said, because um, it's all in the papers about Papworth and all the drugs. And in, she, she was absolutely convinced that it, the hospital was full of drug dealers. There'd been a big 
protest the night before. There'd been all the doctors had come in and it was just a really convincing story, completely ludicrous, but very convincing. It was clear Emma believed it. And I believed it at the time because I went out and bought all the papers to just check to see what had been going on at Papworth. And gradually it dawned on me that this was something that hadn't happened at all. And the first thing that Emma said when I came in was, did you get the papers? And I said, yes. And she said, did you see it? And I said, well, I haven't had a chance to go through them yet. But it was, and I was quite concerned as to how to handle it because I knew that this was, this wasn't real. But Emma absolutely believed it, absolutely believed it. Yeah. Most patients after having the surgery will need oxygen in hospital. But every day your physiotherapist and your nurse will assess your oxygen levels both at rest and whilst you're walking and will try and wean your oxygen. Some patients do need to go home on oxygen because they don't get enough oxygen into the system to meet the demands of their muscles and their organs. So they need to have a bit of oxygen to make sure they can function safely and comfortably at home. If you do need oxygen, your physiotherapist or your nurse will organise that for you and the oxygen company will come to your home and set it up for you. And then your GP will monitor your oxygen levels so that you're not on it any longer than you need to be on it. When Emma came off oxygen, um, it was almost on a daily basis, wasn't it? Wasn't it? You could walk a little bit further. Yeah, and breathe it, better. It's one of those things. At the time, it just seems the be-all and end-all. It takes over your life. And now I look back, and actually, it was about a month. I think a month, six weeks. It was I was. Two, it was two months. Okay, that I was needing oxygen, but as you say, I was gradually just um, using it to walk outside, just taking the mobile oxygen, and then the, the home oxygen. I stopped. Going home is planned when you're well enough to be traveling back in your normal car. And mostly we encourage your family members or friends to take you home in their normal car. And you should be absolutely fine to travel with them. And there are some circumstances that some patients would need uh, uh, other form of transport. Um, that is when you have been started on oxygen before going home uh, from, from Papworth Hospital then we have to arrange a uh, suitable transport for you. That will be arranged by the hospital and for you to be safely going home. And also there are circumstances when you do not have any family or friends uh, to take you home, then Papworth Hospital will make sure that they arrange a proper and suitable transport for you to go home. Journey was tiring um, and I was very sore obviously, but. We put, um, John very thoughtfully brought some cushions with him, so we, cushions under the seatbelt did the job. And I was very, very tired, yeah, but I think I slept some of the journey, but it was okay, yeah, it was fine. In terms of exercise, when you go home, you'll be expected to keep going with the exercises you've been doing in hospital. So your physiotherapist will discuss with you before you go home how much you can do. But what we say, the key is little and often really when you get home. So we advise about two short walks a day. To begin with, it might be just walking from room to room, pottering around the house or around the garden. As I said, the physiotherapist in hospital will go through how far you can walk before you go home. But the key with your walking is that you should be able to walk and talk. So if you can walk with someone at home, just make sure you can hold a conversation. If you can't keep holding that conversation, make sure you stop, catch your breath, and then carry on. And the other important point with your exercise is that you shouldn't be pushing into your breathlessness. So if you're short of breath, stop, catch your breath, and then carry on. The other thing to bear in mind after the operation is that you'll have a wound down your chest which takes about 12 weeks to heal. So during that time, you mustn't lift, pull or push anything over about five pounds or 2.2 kilos in weight. So that's things like lifting up heavy bags, taking washing out of the washing machine, ironing and vacuuming. So you mustn't do those things to make sure you protect your wound. But whilst you're in hospital, your physiotherapist will give you flexibility exercises there that you should do at home to help keep your chest nice and mobile. 
the best advice that I was given whilst I was in hospital and uh, I was with the physios and I was doing some sort of light exercises. They said, when you are at home, when you do feel tired, do not fight it, rest. That was the best advice that I was given. And I really feel that did aid my recovery over a period of two or three months. I have a little bit of residual disease, which I was always made clear all along that I would still have a little bit. Um, and I, my medication has been reduced significantly, but I still have, um, I'm still um, three times a day sildenafil, lowest dose rather than the highest dose from before, um, just to manage that. And I seem to, it doesn't really, get in my way, I don't think, other than that, um, as I say, sometimes I get a bit breathless and um, I have been a little bit giddy on occasion and then I know that's my sign to stop and I, I kind of it, feel that I'm just going to have to live with that, I think that's probably going to, it may go away, but if it doesn't, I know why. Um, but certainly now I've been walking I've been going on walks at home because I was always quite a big walker before. And whereas before I could do a few hundred, maybe a hundred yards, um, I've walked, I think my, my, I've walked five to seven miles walks and, and some of that's uphill as well, which is just something I never thought in a million years I'd be able to do. So that's just amazing. prepare ahead things that you're going to need post-operatively. Real basics like have you got sufficient food stocked up in your cupboards? Is your freezer stocked up? Have you thought of doing online shopping? Or is there a relative that could be doing that shopping for you? Because you won't be allowed to be initially be driving for six to eight weeks and definitely not be carrying shopping or pushing trolleys. With, with regards uh to other patients and uh, support that they would need at home, I would most certainly recommend that uh, they would need to have someone there on their arrival back at home. And I guess it does depend on how quickly they recover, how well they feel when they've actually been discharged from, from hospital. But my own personal opinion is that they would need someone with them for a period of time mm -hmm. until they felt confident enough to be able to sort the, support themselves wholly. If you have any dependents at home who need your help, you obviously need to think about how they're going to be cared or supported while you're in hospital, but not only just while you're in hospital, also during your recovery period, because you're not going to be able to help support them perhaps, and that includes even walking the dog. They don't advise you to be walking and being pulled along by the dog. To help prepare for the operation, I've got a young family, so I've got, um, my baby was 16 months, I've got a 14 year old and we had a six year old. So we arranged for them to go on holiday with um, parents while I was in hospital um, and they had looked after them so they were away, didn't have to worry. Um, I helped Michael out by labeling all the drawers for the children so he knew exactly where all the clothes were, uh, made sure the freezer was full. Um, and then to come home, Michael was at home for a few days and then Michael's sister came and stayed with us so she could help get the children ready for school and pack lunches and all those kinds of things, which you found really helpful, didn't you? If, like I do, you live on your own, the best way to prepare before you come into the operation is make sure that the neighbours, friends are aware Ideally, make sure they've got a key because it's, it sounds daft, but if you are on your home alone, if no one can get into the house, it's, well, it causes problems. And I think in hindsight, you know, it's just the simple things like having somebody to come around and cook a meal for you and, and you know, just to take the washing and the ironing. I think that's, that's really important and maybe on the journey home, if you've got a long journey like us, then maybe we should have stopped halfway overnight and done half the journey and then yeah. come home a bit, because I think that was, it was just far too long. Before you come in for your operation, it would be really beneficial to practice 
things like getting out of an armchair without pushing up through your arms. So to do that, try shuffling forwards in your chair, place your arms across your chest, rock three times to get some momentum, and then push up from the chair. The other thing you can practice is getting out of bed without using your arms. So think about walking your legs to the edge of the bed, rolling onto your side, and then pushing up with your elbow. If you walk with a, a walking aid, a stick, a frame, or you're using a wheelchair, it's very important that you mention that to the um, pre-admission nurses and the specialist nurses before your surgery. They would then refer you to occupational therapy and the discharge planning team. And we would be in touch with you before your operation just to get a few more details and clarify what sort of support we might need to give you during your recovery and on your discharge. To help other patients to prepare, I would most certainly say that uh, they would need a suitable chair which would enable them to actually remove themselves from without actually pressing down with their arms to actually get out of the chair. Also, I would say that uh, they would need to have a form of rest bed downstairs rather than having to uh, walk upstairs to, to go to bed because that I found in the first instance was quite physically challenging. If you have been referred to occupational therapy, we would also follow you up and see you on the ward. That would be going through how you're managing the basics like getting off your chair, bed and toilet. And on very rare occasions, we might be issuing you a piece of equipment that you could use at home temporarily to make that easier. Brilliant. Because I felt so tired and not well, I gave in and just let other people look after me. I think it's harder when I started to feel a bit more able and started to try to do stuff. And then there's a lot of other, and I know it's because they care, but I got a lot from other people, members of family, friends, you know, stop doing that, don't do that, sit down, telling you how to be because they, they're being careful. And me having to relearn everything about how far I could push myself again and what my limits were and you know how much to do before I felt I needed to stop. I think we, we needed need to speak to people, didn't you? Yeah, we needed to talk to people more about it so that people understood. Because I think people just thought I was coming in just for just for a minor operation and and nobody really understood. It was only when I came home that it came as a real shock to people that I was so poorly. Um, and having and been living so far away from the hospital, nobody really came up to see me. It was only Michael and, a, and my best friend, um, and then a couple of family members popped in um, for one day. So I think it just, when we got home, it was a bit of a shock to everybody, just quite how poorly I was. It's hard to describe, although you're told what to expect, until you actually experience it and see it, you can't, you can't, Ex just simply explain to someone what that's going to be like. You can prepare, you know, as best you can, but to actually be in that situation, it's like the only way I can th and think of it is is um, it's like uh, we, we've done a lot of travelling, and if you, you go to a country maybe very different from ours, and you read the guidebooks about what to expect um, and how how the culture works and and how you do things, and that's great. But you step off the plane and. It's just there, it's exactly what's described, but now you're experiencing it, and that's, that's very different. You will be sent home with a discharge information booklet, which has got wealth of information, and it would be, I highly recommend that you carry these booklets all the time with you, at least for a few months, uh, to make sure that you are doing the right thing. Everything was in the information booklet, in fact, which I did read, but you kind of... You I read think, it? I think you pick out the bits that you think are going to uh, be relevant to you and brush over the other stuff, because my whole experience ended up the other stuff was what actually happened. We took the information pack, um, which they found really helpful because it told them everything they needed to know. Um, so I kept that on me at all times, didn't matter where we went or anything. I just made sure I had all the information just in case. Um, and they found that really, they thanked us for bringing it. Yeah. Uh, 
and they like the pictures on the on the yeah. phone you got sent. <laughs> so they've never seen, they don't normally obviously see you know see the operation and they and the blood clots themselves. So just to see them on the phone and stuff and the pictures, it sort of went round the accident emergency <laughs> and stuff just to just to have a look. I think. I've spoken to the nurses at Papworth a couple of times since I was since I went home after the op. I did speak to them a few times because. I feel that any kind of worry I've got, that I'm, they're the people to talk to in the first instance because they obviously have, they know what I've been through and they have all the knowledge and expertise, far more than obviously the GP. I, I knew that they was there, they were providing me with their telephone numbers, their bleep numbers and uh, yeah, when I needed them, they were there. I, I, I have to say that uh, it, I may not have called them on many occasions, but uh, I was confident in knowing that if I needed to speak with them, there was someone there to support me. Most patients are, uh, and the family are much concerned about going home. Uh, it's, it's just mainly because they are far away from Papworth and you had the surgery here and you would be worried that how am I going to manage. Um, the GP is the first point of contact for you and you contact the GP when you feel uh, um, that you have some infections in your wound, uh, you have increased shortness of breath or you have any uh, ankle swelling um, or you, you may be coughing up uh, any phlegm. Any of these circumstances you see the GP and they should be able to uh, manage this uh, at their level. If they are not able to manage, maybe they will uh, uh, consult with your local um, respiratory team. And there is also help available for you with your local pulmonary hypertension uh, team who have referred you to Papworth Hospital. You may have to contact the emergency services through calling 999. There are circumstances when you have severe chest pain or your breathing pattern has changed or you, when you have severe headache that hasn't been resolved by uh, having paracetamol, or also even you may be having um, increased uh, heart pounding sort of feeling. These are the circumstances you may have to contact the emergency services without even waiting for the GP to respond. I would recommend that um, patients and families perhaps ask the team what resources they're aware of and would recommend um, perhaps rather than um, just searching the whole of the internet because there's going to be lots of information that um, that will be mis that may misinform them um, so I would I would definitely go to the team and ask for that information there was one blip I would call it when I did feel really run down and tired and a bit dizzy when I and and I phoned Annie at Papworth was my she was my first port of call. Um, gave me advice, and I went to the doctor, got checked over, and I was fine. But the reassurance was was huge from that. It was a good th a good move. And afterwards, I remember Annie coming back to me and saying, "Well, now you know you've done too much. You need to just slow down a bit." So. The Pulmonary Hypertension Association was of great help to me, not only before the operation, in as much as that um, the condition that I had is a very rare condition and it was very difficult to explain to uh, my family or other third parties what the condition was. But I was contacted by the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, invited to one of their meetings, and there I was amongst people that had either had the operation, were possibly going to be offered the op, but I was able to speak with them and they would understand how I actually felt. So I have to say the Pulmonary Hypertension Association I've kept in contact with and it was also nice to speak with them with regards to uh, their experiences before and after the operations.